Hello again, it's Maria with you here today reading from my book The Portal of Zebulon from the Ark of Dunroa series and today we're on to chapter 8. Don't forget to subscribe and to like and to share. Um, you can go on to Arc Book, uh, Arc Books on Facebook if you want to pass some comments or tell me what you think of it or if you have any ideas, anything else you'd like me to do um, or else go on to the Ark of Dunroa dot wordpress dot com so that's a r c of dunrua r u a h dot wordpress dot com and leave comments um so i'm reading a chapter today and today we're on chapter eight the story so far we have simon and kerry mackin on a great adventure they're heading off to zebulon to reopen an ancient portal there that's been shut down destroying that part of the world that that they're living in and um Simon and Kerry have been attacked by sea serpents on board the Ark of Dunrua and Simon has been injured. So we'll take up the story at chapter 8, the city of Maya. The wind rose as the Ark of Dunrua creaked and lurched. Its motor started to turn and the ship moved across the open seas. Gradually it picked up speed and a stream of cool air blew through the porthole. Simon lay on his bunk, suffering from a painful sea serpent bite. The refreshing breeze helped to lower his temperature, but his body was still shaking. At last, Timmy returned through the porthole, carrying a little packet in his beak. Dr. Odette said, to put this ointment on your wound, said Timmy, it's for the pain. She also said to take these anti-venom tablets immediately. Kerry opened the packet and took out a tiny jar of black ointment and a vial with three white tablets. She twisted the cap off the ointment and went to examine Simon's arm. The skin was very swollen around the two deep fang marks. Kerry rubbed the contents of the jar on the wound and immediately Simon's face react and colour returned to his cheeks. The shaking lessened. It's working already, he said. Then Kerry gave him the tablets with some water and within minutes the shaking stopped completely and the swelling on Simon's arm visibly reduced. It's healing, he said, and the pain is going away. I heard that many of the crew got attacked by the sea serpents and have multiple bites, said Timmy, but the doctor said the antidote works really well. I also met Grinwick and he said to tell you that the ship is back on its correct route. Some flying sea serpents got stuck in the motors and that's why it came to a standstill. But now the crew have repaired the damage and were heading straight for the land of Maya. As the evening progressed, the marks of Simon's sea serpent bite faded. The fierce heat died down and the winds rose higher. Dark clouds surrounded the vessel and the ship heaved and tossed in the waves. Grinwick and Farador arrived to escort them to the navigation room to plan the rest of their journey with the captain. When they entered the controls room, Kerry was relieved to see that Captain Wilcox was back at the helm, although he did look very pale. Dr. Odette was standing at his side and they were deep in conversation. She had a worried expression on her face, but when she saw Kerry, she smiled. The captain invited them all to join him at his chart table. We'll be dropping you off at the port of Maya within the next half hour, said the captain with a slight wheeze. We've docked there many times. It was once a beautiful city, but now it's full of criminals and pickpockets. In recent times, it's been overrun by vultures. Keep to yourselves and get out of it as fast as you can. Then follow the river inland to the border of Zebulon. You'll find refuge in the mountains. There are many camps there to support the people who are fleeing from Zebulon. They'll look after you. Are Grinwick and Farador coming with us? Kerry asked. When the captain is well enough, he will release them, said Dr. Odette. I'm a bit worried about his health right now. He relies a lot on the giant eagles for protection. And many of the crew members are still suffering from sea serpent bites. We're very short handed. But Kerry and Simon need protection too, said Dot. They've been through a lot over the last few days and Kerry still has those bruises on her neck. Keep focused on your mission, Kerry, said Odette, and those wounds will disappear completely. The man in white who attacked you planted a seed of fear inside your heart. 
but you don't have to give in to it. If you feed these dark thoughts, they will consume you. So thank God for your life and be grateful for the good things. Then you will have health in abundance. I know you will recover from this stronger than you ever were before. I feel a lot better now, said Kerry. That's good. Malachi told me that he chose you and Simon for this mission because your hearts are so pure. Don't let anyone defile your mind, no matter how much pain they cause you. Keep your hearts free from hatred. It's the only way you will survive this journey. Captain Wilcox rose to his feet. It's nearly time to disembark, he said. So go and get ready. I promise that I'll send the giant eagles after you in a day or so. Oh, and here, he said, handing Simon a wallet. You'll need some local money to get you through the next few days. You look after it, Kerry, said Simon, passing it on to his sister. She thanked the captain and stored the wallet in her jacket pocket. And watch out for pickpockets, he said. Within minutes, they heard the ship's bell ringing. Land ahoy, called the crew. We've reached the city of Maya. Prepare to disembark. Grinwick and Farador escorted Kerry, Simon and the Swifttails through the ship's hatch and down the gangway into the city streets. They led them into the heart of the ancient Maya. The footpaths were throng thronged with beggars and street criers. People wore long, colourful tunics with contrasting turbans and scarves on their heads. Crowds of people were busy shopping and hurrying home from work. Grinwick and Farador flew down to perch on a street bench close to the harbour. It's a pity we can't go with you now, said Grinwick, but the captain needs us on the ship for another day or so. Then we'll follow you to Zebulon. But if you run into trouble, be sure to send the Swifttails straight back to get us. Keep going along the harbour until you meet the river, added Farador, and follow it inland to the mountains. Be careful around Maya and don't trust anybody. Make sure that you get through the city gates before nightfall. There's a curfew after dark. Oh, and be careful of the pickpockets. They're everywhere. Expect to see us soon, called Grinwick as the eagles flew back to their ship. Simon, Kerry and the Swifttails continued on to a large square by the seafront. Stalls decked out with spices and colourful household goods filled the marketplace. Vendors sang songs to attract people's attention to their wares. Children ran around the streets playing games and having fun together. Timmy and Dot flew ahead to scout for the river that led to the mountains. After they left, Kerry felt somebody tugging gently at her arm. She turned to see a little girl with long, dark, wavy hair. She smiled at them sweetly. Would you like to buy some spices, she said. No thanks, said Kerry. We don't need spices. Well, where are you going? We're going to the mountains, said Kerry. You better hurry, said the little girl. There's a curfew at night time. If you want, I can take you to the north gate. Pay me and I'll be your guide. Are you sure you know where the north gate is, said Simon. You look a bit young to be a guide. Of course I do. Give me a silver coin and I'll have you there in no time. Two silver coins, said a boy, suddenly appearing behind, beside her. My sister is too young to take you on her own. You'll be needing my services too. It's a deal, said Simon. Give them two silver coins, Kerry. After Kerry took out the wallet to pay them, the children led them through the winding streets of the ancient city. Old yellow flagstones paved the road and sand-coloured stone buildings rose against the cloudy sky. They were covered in ancient carvings. Perched in the eaves of many houses, they saw flocks of yellow neck vultures congregating. Those vultures are everywhere, said Kerry. Nasty things, said the little girl. My father tells us to stay away from them. They come from the dark lands beyond the mountains. Everybody hates them. They're trying to kill the refugees from Zebulon. Shut up, said the boy. You're not allowed to talk like that. The girl stuck her tongue out at him. He tried to kick her, but she ducked out of his way. Soon they reached the bank of a swiftly flowing river. A large flock of vultures sat over a distant bridge. 
they made deep hissing sounds as they passed close to their heads. The children led them along the river's edge through many run-down streets. The boy took a right turn into one of the alleys. Hold it, said Simon. Why are you leading us away from the river? That's not the main river, said the boy. There's a much bigger one that will take you towards the mountains. It's this way. As they continued, the alleys grew narrower and the houses more squalid. A slanting sun cast long shadows over the decrepit streets. Simon was uneasy. Are you sure you know where you're going? He asked. Have patience. We'll be at the outskirts in a few minutes, said the boy. After several more twists and turns, there was still no sign of a river. Simon grew more anxious. Then to his relief, he saw Timmy and Dot catching up with them. You're going the wrong way, said Timmy, landing on his shoulder. The mountains are behind you. Simon grabbed the boy's shoulder. What do you think you're doing, he said. Give us back our money, we'll find our own way. A scream came from behind them. Simon turned to see the girl running towards them with Kerry chasing after her. Thief, yelled Kerry, give me back my wallet. Simon blocked the girl's way and grabbed the wallet, but the girl kept a tight grip on it. It's my wallet, yelled the girl. You were robbers. Simon tried to prise the wallet out of the girl's hand, but she kicked him in the shins and yelled at the top of her voice. Police, help, help. He put his hand over her mouth to stop her shouting. Struggling wildly, she bit him, broke free and fled down the street with the wallet in her hand. Simon soon caught up, but she tossed the wallet to her brother, who caught it neatly and disappeared over the wall. Simon followed him. Kerry caught up with the girl and grabbed her arm. She stamped on Kerry's foot and scratched her face with her nails. As they struggled, Simon re-entered from the alley and caught the girl by the ear. Where is your brother, he demanded. Tell us where you live. No. Tell me or I'll call the police. Hey, what's going on, came a man's voice behind them. Let my daughter go, he said, pushing Simon aside. He was a tall and rough looking man with dark curly hair. The girl fell into her father's arms, sobbing her heart out. Your daughter stole my money, said Kerry. No, it's mine, sobbed the girl. She pointed at Simon. That boy hit me and he pulled my ear. Tears poured down her face. You and your brother are liars and thieves, accused Simon. It's your word against hers, said the man, and you've no right to come into our city and harass the local children. We were minding our own business, said Simon, until these kids came looking for money. We paid them to show us the way to the mountains. By now, a crowd of local people was forming around them. A stocky policeman with a large belly appeared on the scene. What's going on here, he said. No loitering is allowed on the streets of Maya. Get back into your houses. These kids stole my sister's wallet, said Simon. And who might you be, said the policeman, taking out his notebook. You're certainly not from around here. My name is Simon Mackin, my sister's name is Kerry, and this is the thief, he pointed at the girl. Are these allegations true, the policeman asked the little girl. No, said her father, these strangers have made the whole story up. They were trying to force my son and daughter to take them to one of the bandit camps in the mountains. That's not true, said Simon, his face turned flaming red. It appears that there's no evidence against this child, said the policeman. If she's got the stolen wallet on her person, you can't. If she hasn't got the stolen wallet on her person, you can't prove that she took it. Go and find her brother then, said Simon. He's got it. Look here, boy. Don't you dare come around here and tell me what to do. I happen to know this child and her family. They are well-respected citizens of this community, unlike yourselves. I suspect that you too are up to no good. You're the same as all the other foreigners who come here trying to rip us off. We're telling the truth, said Simon. What kind of place is this anyway? Excuse yourself, boy. I'm not having you stand around here accusing the honest working citizens of this town of theft and bringing down the name of our city. You'd better watch your tongue or you'll land yourself in a whole heap of trouble. 
It's all right, Simon, interrupted Kerry. Let's just get out of here. No, insisted Simon. This policeman is an idiot. We are visitors to this city and we have rights. I demand to be taken to the embassy. The policeman blew his whistle. I'm taking you to the police station, he said. I don't like your attitude. It's gross disrespect to speak to a chief inspector like that. A large crowd of onlookers had now gathered around watching the proceedings. Within seconds, three more policemen arrived on the scene. What's the problem, Chief Inspector Daff, said one of them. We have two thieves on our hands, said Daff. They have insulted me. They have attacked a young child. I'm told they're heading to a bandit camp in the mountains. Escort them to the station. There's no need for any of this, said Kerry. My brother will apologise. I'm sorry. He shouldn't have talked to you like that. Please let us go. It's too late for that now, said the Chief Inspector. Keep moving or you'll get yourselves, yourselves into even more trouble. This is crazy. I demand my legal rights, said Simon. You don't have any legal rights here, said Daff, producing a set of handcuffs. He grabbed Simon by the arm. Let me go, you brute, said Simon, pushing him out of the way. The Chief Inspector lost his balance and tripped over a curb and fell. His large black hat twisted sideways as he sat in stunned silence in the gutter. Then, slowly, his face turned purple. Arrest that boy, he roared. Within seconds, a young policeman pinned Simon to the ground, handcuffed him and frisked him. After confiscating his fire blade, he pulled him to his feet. Followed by a large crowd, Simon and Kerry were escorted to the end of the street and onto the main thoroughfare. They arrived at a large stone complex surrounded by high walls. The words town jail were written over the metal gates. Why are you bringing us here? said Simon. We'll discuss that inside, boy. Now do what you're told. And that is the end of chapter seven. So I will be back tomorrow with the next chapter, chapter eight, we're going on to. Um, I'm doing a chapter a day, so please join with me and don't forget to like and subscribe and share and talk to you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you so much for joining me.